This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. What's up, Chief Kingdom? Welcome to this week's edition of 21 Questions, the podcast by the people for the people here on KC Sports Network. I'm Tucker Franklin, joined this week by Charles Goldman, A to Z Sports, also does the KCSN Daily Newsletters. Charles, how you doing, my man? I'm doing great, man. I'm happy to be uh, back here answering some uh, questions from Chiefs Kingdom. We've done a couple of these 21 questions together, a couple pods together, obviously. If you don't know who Charles is, are you really even a Chiefs fan? That's a, that's a question to ask yourself. Uh, that's because, uh, Charles, you, you know what? Uh, you do a great job covering the league. Uh, you're kind of the standard when it comes to a lot of the things. And after the uh, after the games get done, I go straight to your Twitter feed for all of the presser information and everything like that. So, I uh, really appreciate your work and really appreciate you you hopping on always for us here at KC Sports Support. Thanks, man. I I appreciate the kind words. You you know uh, you know how much uh, I put into this as much as anybody. Yeah, so I appreciate that. Let's get right into the questions. If you want to ask questions on Twenty One Questions, super simple. You hop into the Discord. You can do it there. Not a part of the Discord. You can uh, subscribe to KCS and Daily five dollars. A uh, five dollars a month, thirty a year for that deal on the KCSN Substack. Go to kcsn.substack.com. You can get a part of that deal in the receipt email or your confirmation email of your subscription. You'll get a link to join the Discord. That's how you hop in there. We've got a channel in there for uh, twenty-one questions. We've also got got all kinds of channels. Listen, as we're recording this, college recruiting is hot and heavy. National Signing Day on Wednesday, so we got a lot of talk going on in the uh, the college football channels, the Mizzou one uh, specifically for me, as you can tell by my nice home field apparel hoodie. Uh, we're going we're going hard in that channel as well. But let's start with the 21 questions, obviously. We're going to start with Nick Deal, who asked, don't shoot the messenger, but what does your Kelsey succession plan look like? Yeah, uh, a Kelsey succession plan, you know? It, it's tough to think about that. Uh, especially because he's still performing so well, right? He's you know a couple like uh, you know 60, 60 yards or so away from his like what is it, eighth consecutive thousand yard season. Yeah, crazy, just like absolutely crazy. But um, this is actually I don't know. Some people don't like this uh, this tight end class. I really like it. I think there's like some guys who you can get late day two, day three, um, who. You know, you can develop, you know, maybe they won't have that Kelsey type impact, but like there's some guys who can help you along as you're kind of finding your way after Travis. Um, I really like this kid out of uh, out of Minnesota, uh, Brevin Span Ford. He's just like freakish athlete. I've seen him like, you know, um, hurdle guys, you know, with the ball in his hands. Uh, he can separate against linebackers and safeties, give you some some, you know good play across the middle of the field and even down the field. And then he's just like an absolute dog in the trenches. Like he is my favorite blocker in this class. He just buries guys. Uh, he, he's like having, you know, they it, it's like a platitude of, of tight end play when you get them lining up with the offensive line that they're like having an extra offensive lineman, but he is legitimately like having an extra offensive lineman. Like he's going to, he's going to blow the best, uh, defensive end off the ball, just completely off the ball. And uh, I, I really, really, really like him. I think but that's a guy like if Kelsey's got a couple more years left, let's bring him in, you know, and have him on the field in some of these, you know, 12 personnel, uh, 13 personnel looks. And, you know, when Kelsey's getting all that attention, you know, pl- playing decoy a little bit, you got another, another tight end who can kind of do a little bit in the passing game, do a little bit in the run game as well. Yeah, Kelsey's succession plan is interesting to think about because I don't know you're not going to be able to just directly replace his <laughs> his production level, and I think if you do want to per- replace that production level, it's going to probably be at the wide receiver position, I would assume. But so that's probably the immediate succession plan of like, okay, what do we have to do right now? You have to per- re- replace that production. It's probably going to be in the wide receiver room, I would assume. I like those options that you that you laid out in the draft. Obviously, for those tight end guys, if for for cases that aren't necessarily as pressing, I think a lot of people look at this draft and they see Brock Bowers at the top of a guy that maybe the Chiefs. Oh, maybe they could trade up and get Brock Bowers or uh, Jatavion Sanders was a very fun guy from Texas. 
could possibly be there at, at you know, wherever the Chiefs end up picking towards the end of the first round. Um, but I don't know if those are directions that the Chiefs want to go with their first round pick. Um, so those are all going to be very interesting um, names to keep your eye on. I've, I mean, I've seen Brock Bowers go as high as like number five, number six uh, in this draft. So he's he's a very highly touted uh, prospect. Benson is a fun one that every time I watch a Kansas State game, I'm just like, that guy can get open. That guy is not afraid of the physicality. He could be a good late round guy. Uh, I, I, I like the way that he plays, uh, and he was just always open, dude. He, he just seems like he was always able to find spots, always able to, to find creases, everything like that. He could be a, a fun middle, mid to late round guy, uh, add for the, for the tight end position. But, but I think if you're looking at just like immediate succession, it's probably going to be a big time. You're probably going to have to add like a big time wide receiver in terms of production, I should say, uh, for the, for the offense, uh, to add it there, but uh, the K Gummager asked us, Christian, would you rather have the one seed, but the Bills and Bengals make the playoffs, or do, you, or you have to play the wild card weekend and one of the two don't make the playoffs? Always the one seed. I, I think it's always the one seed because yeah, you know, I mean, you can't really control your opponents. You know, I mean, either of them could get knocked out before you even play a game if you're the one seed, right? So. And then also there's just the fact of having that bye week is so crucial, so crucial, uh, yeah. especially when like the Chiefs are in a situation like they are right now to get the one seed, you have to play all your starters for the next three games. And, you know, you're going to get some guys who get banged up, like having that extra week to get some guys healthy, just super important, uh, I think for, for the stretch and, um, It'd be great if things fall in line and and the Chiefs can can make that happen, but uh, unfortunately, it it is out of their control, right? They, they have to depend on some other teams and some other things happening um, to ensure that they have a shot at that one seed. Yeah, and that's what that's what sucks. You always want to have the uh, have your fate decided by yourself. I don't think the Chiefs don't really have that anymore. They got to rely on uh, have a little bit of help. But I agree with you on the on the one seed. Um, that it's always the one seed that bye week is so precious uh, in the in the NFL. Just to have that extra week off is huge. And this next question is from Mike Diddy, the Swifty liaison uh, in the KCSN Discord. He asks us on the uh, in parentheses, admittedly wild Fox broadcast. They mentioned that the Patriots had some drops in key penalties. When you take that into account with their good defense, are the Kansas City Chiefs one Patrick Mahomes away from being three and eleven? Um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think there is any reality where the Chiefs <laughs> would have been three and 11. I look, um, and, and I think you, you look no further than the big man, big red, uh, yeah, 11 straight winning season. Like, um, it, it's one of the reasons he, he's just so great. Uh, he finds ways to win games with what he's got. And, uh, you know, he doesn't have a great receiver room this year. we found that out through the course of the season but he still found a way um for nine games so far so yeah um i i think that it you know patrick mahomes obviously incredibly great uh just you know remarkable talent uh and irreplaceable but i i think you know big red is equally irreplaceable when it comes to winning I think so too. We've seen him do it with a bunch of different quarterbacks in a bunch of different situations. Something you can't really say about Bill Belichick. Uh, we we've seen Andy Reid go to different teams and win different quarterbacks, different situations. Um, to, 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 I think it's funny we can talk about that Fox broadcast because I, Charles, I don't know how much you paid attention to that Fox broadcast, but it was bad. I know that they probably had to scramble to try to be good again. It, it was it. It wasn't it wasn't fun to watch for anyone involved. I don't, I can't imagine a Patriots fan had fun to watch it, fun watching it either because they were just dogging on the team the whole time. And then I, I get that they were probably trying to scramble because this game was moved from Monday and this was an AFC game on Fox, which is kind of already weird to begin with. They got stuck with like the C crew because that's probably who was free, uh, basically at the at the time. I don't know all the like the dynamics that go into that, but it was just one of those broadcasts that just like. 
bad vibes uh, from the jump. I, and and to be fair to those guys, they probably don't see a lot of Chiefs. Like they don't see a lot of Chiefs games, so they don't have a whole lot of those prior relationships and everything with the coaching staff and and all the uh, the pr- on the production side of things and and trying to get all the information from them. But it just wasn't a very good broadcast. You know, I'm I'm as bad as that broadcast was. I'm worried about the alternate broadcast for this upcoming game. They've got Chiefs versus Raiders on Nickelodeon yep. for a bunch of kids to see. I mean, this is one of the most like heated, like violent rivalries in the history of football. Like literally, Patrick Mahomes was caught screaming, "You messed with the wrong mother effer." The last time these two teams, you know, met at Arrowhead Stadium uh, to to uh, Max Crosby. I, I just don't feel like this game is like meant for the eyes of children on Nickelodeon. I think it's going to be a great production, but I think there's going to be some moments where that were like, Ooh, that might have not been appropriate, <laughs> but, but you know, and, and when they pan to the Raiders fans in the audience dressed up like. I mean, they're going to give some kids some nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of some of my vivid memories of, of watching Raiders games as a kid. It's like, wow, oh, their fans are scary because they dress up like like horror characters. Like, that's essentially what they dress up as. And it's not a very uh, not a very kid-friendly environment from what I've heard back in, uh, you know, Oakland when they were back over there. And I think they've kind of... Well, Vegas isn't really very kid friendly either, but I think it's kind of, uh, I think it's kind of mellowed out a little bit from like Oakland in terms of two sides of the spectrum, both still a very an adult eighteen plus scene. Yeah, it it, it seems a little a little bit risky. Um, the the NFL, I don't know who made that decision, but they might find themselves regret. Yeah. They might. So uh, let's get to this question from uh, B Higgs since we're talking about the Chiefs Raiders game. Uh, B Higgs underscore Prince Felix, how do you feel about the noon Christmas game um, and that noon time slot? I mean, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of them playing on Christmas, obviously, just because of the holiday and everything. But I'm glad it's at noon, I guess, rather than waiting around all day for it and having to do stuff during the day for it. I don't know how you feel, uh, Charles, about uh, the Christmas game day. I don't know. I, I feel like there's like two sides to, to the coin a little bit, right? Like if you're in Kansas City and you have an opportunity to give, you know, your your child or um, a family member the experience of going to the Chiefs game on Christmas Day, that's got to be a cool experience. I remember going, I think it was Christmas Eve when they played um, the Broncos. Uh, that was the Dontari Poe touchdown game. Um and, and that was a lot of fun, even though the weather was kind of gross and whatever. It was still like a really cool experience or memory. Um, obviously, it was a little later in my life. I wasn't a kid or whatnot. But, um, you know, uh, I, I think that could be a cool experience for some families. So so that's something that's, that's cool. But also, I'm just kind of like, you know, I mean, it, it, this is a time that you're supposed to spend with your family and... Um, you know, having it be a new a new name, um, I feel like that's going to kind of rush some things. And the more you know, it's no Christmas. You like to be cozy, maybe sleep in a little bit. The kids try to wake up early, go get their presents from from under the tree. You know, what have you? Like, um, I I feel like rushing that experience on a holiday. That's that's mm-hmm. no fun for families and whatnot. And you know, I I I think about. You and I and uh, all, all the other people who are out here working, covering the game, it's no fun to work on a holiday. Uh, you know, yeah. whether you're someone from the broadcast team or writer, or beat writer, um, you know, podcast or what have you. It's just it's it's um, it, it's definitely it can be draining. It's absolutely draining if the game <laughs> doesn't go the way you hope. <laughs> right. But um, and, and yeah, I, I just um you know, I know the NFL, they get big numbers on days like this, so it's never going to change. They're never not going to have games on holidays. Probably they will have a game on like every possible holiday that they can in the near future. But, um, you know, even they even got the black Friday, right? Like, um, so it's just, um, one of those things where you kind of have to get used to it a little bit when you're doing what we do. 
Um, but I, I don't think fans should be happy about it. Um, you know, I think, I think there's, there's plenty of reason to be, uh, disappointed yeah. as well as plenty of reason to be excited if you're, if you're going to the game. For sure. I think you did a good job of kind of summing up, uh, all the feelings that I had about it too. It's just one of those things where, where do you draw the line at it for the NFL, right? If you're just going to keep, uh, keep getting all of these, I don't want to say money grab games, but they know that people are going to be at home and in front of a TV more than likely. And if they're at home, they can turn on a TV pretty easily. So they know that the eyes on the game uh, will be probably the mo- more than if just like a regular Monday night game. Like, so they're going to have three, they have three games on Christmas. They're going to have the full slate. They'll probably do more numbers than the NBA will. I know the NBA has always done Christmas, but again, that's one of those things where, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if people are working into their traditions. They probably will, you know, we'll probably uh, have people work around. Uh, I know we're already working around the Chiefs game for what we're doing for Christmas and everything like that. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that the noon the noon kickoff is, I don't know, maybe that's the most unfortunate timing the more that I think about it because it is just like smack dab in the middle of everything when it, when it comes down to it. If it's the night game, you can at least do some stuff in the morning and then the, and the, all the way to like the late afternoon even and before the game kicks off and everything like that. But, uh, yeah, we'll, I'm, we'll probably see more of these holiday games going forward. You mentioned the Black Friday. I don't wasn't a huge on the uh, the NFL stepping on the the Black Friday um, time slot that the college football traditionally has. Um, they just It's kind of a, I think it is actually technically a written rule <laughs> that they can't really uh, broadcast at the same time as, as college. I think that the NFL got around it with the Broadcasting Act from the 40s, I believe is what it was, um, where they broadcasted at 3 Eastern, I think is what it was, or the, the games were on at the same time as the college games, so they could still do it in terms of the uh, the competitive a- aspect of it. So um, they're going to they're gonna do whatever they can to get the most money. We've seen that. We know that about the NFL. Um, that's, just, that's just how it is. Um, but... Next question here is from Kay Gummager. Will the 49ers be favored by double digits until the Super Bowl? Right now, looking at our friends at DraftKings Sportsbook, they are five-and-a-half-point favorites over the Ravens on a game, which is the night game on the uh, three-day game slate, the three-game slate on Christmas Day. That's going to be a really good game, uh, that Ravens-Niners game. Five-and-a-half-point favorites at home uh, for the Niners, and they look like they're the best team in football right now, Charles. Yeah, they're uh, they're on a hot streak, and you know, um, it only takes one one team to kind of interrupt that hot streak. And I think yep. the Ravens are going to give them some trouble, uh, especially I think that defense is a little bit a little bit underrated right now, um, especially the D line. I mean, obviously, I think they're the leader in the league in, in sacks, so you can't really be underrated as that. But I, I think that like, yeah, they're 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 going to give that. 49ers offensive line a little bit of a hard time. They're going to make Christian McCaffrey's day a little tougher. Uh, you know, put some heat on Brock Purdy. So I, I think, like you said, I think that's probably one of the best matchups of the day. It's going to be a, that's going to be a fun. One. It's going to be a really good one. And uh, NFL fans, it's time to unwrap nonstop football action this holiday season. Throw down on big matchups with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. This week, new customers can bet five bucks on the NFL and score 150 instantly in bonus bets. On the Christmas Day, she's favored by 10 points at home versus the Las Vegas Raiders. And you can download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now with code KCSN. New customers can bet five dollars on NFL action to score 150 instantly in bonus bets only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code KCSN. The crown is yours. Here we go. Ready for the disclaimer? Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bits expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash football. For eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. All right, Charles, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with more 21 questions. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. 
Just search KC Sports Network. Welcome back in to 21 questions here on KC Sports Network. Uh, let's get back into it. From Arrow, Clyde is great. Who on the Chiefs team gives off the most sleepy boy vibes? This is a question that I was uh, I was kind of pondering a little bit. Um, it's not Jerk McKinnon. I think Jerk McKinnon is a big old ball of energy. Yeah. He probably doesn't have it a whole lot. Uh, Joshua Williams seems kind of sleepy to me a little bit. It seems like he could always kind of be sleepy, but... I'm thinking his, like, counterpart. I, I was thinking Jalen Watson kind of gave off oh, sleepy boy so vibes a little bit, you know? Um, it, it just, every time I've I've heard him speak, it's always, like, kind of the same tone. Uh-huh. And he, he, he doesn't seem... Not that he's, like, not an energetic guy, but... I don't know that like he's that same like ball of energy type that that you know maybe like yeah. a like Pacheco or a, or a McKinnon is, and you know another one that I was considering too. I feel like Tershawn Wharton. Oh yeah, got some sleepy boy boy vibes a little bit. You know, I agree. I could definitely see that. I was trying to think on the offensive side of the ball. Joe Tooney kind of gives off some sleepy, yeah, some sleepy energy yeah. just because he's just a quiet guy, man. It's a quiet guy, keeps to himself, does his does his task, but you don't really hear a whole lot from him. Uh, he seems pretty sleepy. But like, I don't think I feel, the offense has a lot of them, truthfully. I feel like with Joe Tooney, though, like the thing, like, because we know he he plays chess, right? Like, he, oh, he yeah. plays chess. I bet if you get him and Justin Reed in a chess game, there there's gonna be there's gonna be some some non sleepy boy vibes in that one. <laughs> it's true. Hey, I'm trying to think, maybe. Noah Gray kind of gives off a little bit of sleepy vibes, but I don't I think I like think the defense like, has more. I feel like Noah Gray is more like the the like secret non sleepy boy. Like I feel like behind the Ooh. scenes he's probably like like a little bit more like a little rowdy, more rowdy, but a little bit more wild. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that for sure. Well, states like that, man. I mean, come on, you got to be a little bit of rowdy sometimes. <laughs> I get it. Uh, I get it. I appreciate the question there, Arrow. Um, thank the Frank. He asks, up to this point, what has been your favorite moment from this Chief season? Everything Taylor Swift, only because everybody else hates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I, I've i been amused by the whole thing. Uh, uh, that's, that's probably my answer. <laughs> if we're talking purely like football, though, um. Everything that happened in the Kadarius Tony play that was wiped out last week mm. until it was wiped out. Until the flag was thrown. <laughs> Just enjoying that like like fifteen seconds of glee when we thought we just saw one of the most like crazy improvised plays in NFL history. That was uh, that was that was that was good. Good fifteen seconds there. It's been a wild season. I just like started thinking back to what kind of what all has happened. Obviously, you mentioned the whole Taylor Swift. I don't want to necessarily say saga because I think that can kind of have some negative connotations. Just the whole Taylor Swift developments and how now all of these celebrities are Chiefs fans now. Like, that's kind of crazy. Uh, and she's like buying stuff from local Kansas City places uh, for for Chiefs. Like, that's insane. That's incredible. She may, may not be like living in Kansas City. <laughs> City part time now. Who knows? <laughs> Truly astonishing. That's the most yeah. popular person in the world right now. Probably um, paint with a broad brush there, but like the, probably not very incorrect when I start to think about it more. But even thinking back to opening night with Chris Jones sitting in a box with his agents side by side, like that seems so long ago. Like I, I saw that screenshot and I was like, I, that simultaneously seems like yesterday and three years ago, all at the same time. Because like this season has been, uh, this season has been wild, and just from the ups and downs of you mentioned even the Kadarius Tony play, it seems like week to week we just have a crazy moment that's coming, uh, from every game. The the missed pass interference call. You had the Jawan Taylor, uh, Chris Collinsworth calling him out on opening night that it kind of snowballing to what it is now. Like it's it's been one of the weirdest seasons. Um, I can remember, but I, I I think the Taylor Swift stuff is is probably what I will always remember this season by, 
no matter how the football ends up. Truthfully, uh, when you start to think about it, like, wow, they had the most famous pop star in the world on the sidelines or in the stadium for most of their games, which is yeah, going to be me. Road games, too. There's been one. Yeah. It's heard yeah. up on all the road games. Like, that's 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 dedication right there. And, and, and like, I, I think, you know, of this, one of my favorite moments probably came from uh, the last game with the, like, the Travis Kelsey when he got pushed. In the end zone, and she, the camera pans to her, and she stands up and probably screamed the f word. I have no idea. That's what it looked like. <laughs> yeah, your lips, but like, I mean, uh, that that's like the moment where like you, you realize that she's become a, a true fan of the game when she's yeah. like noticing a no call, <laughs> right? Like she's like, "What the heck? Like should have been a penalty." You know, I, I think uh, that's pretty. Just like us, that she's she's turned into into one of us at this point, uh, yelling obscenities at a game. It's it's perfect uh, when it comes uh, down to it. Uh, Z Andrea he asked us this question: Will the Chiefs have beaten any division winners at the end of the year? This is an interesting question when you think about like Jacksonville's kind of on a slide recently. Um, who else have they played? Miami probably won't have, end up ending winning that division. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't, off the top of my head, I would say I don't think that they will. I don't know. I think Miami has a, a, a decent chance. I, I mean, with where they're at right now, I mean, I know the Bills are on kind of a heater, but um, that's fair. I, I, I feel like, you know, Miami, Jacksonville could still end up, you know, those are your two that you're probably looking at because you, obviously you're not playing the Ravens this year. Um, so, you know, somehow I I don't I don't know I don't think uh, I guess if the Ravens lose the next three somehow I, I think the Bengals could pop up there. Uh, that's true. But uh, I, I think you know that would also mean that the, the if the Bengals popped up there, it'd mean they beat us, which you know uh, mm. not ideal, <laughs> right? So yeah, I I completely forgot with how hot that the uh, the Bills are that they're like not actually in the lead for that division. Um. Yeah, the Dolphins are still ten and four, which it seems yeah. like, and it, those four losses that have been to to, to good teams. Uh, yeah, they cannot they cannot beat a good team, but it just seems like the momentum. If you just stuff top of my head, the momentum seemed not on their side. But they, I mean, they've got they've got a, a somewhat tough schedule coming up. Not as tough as like the Ravens or, or other ones like there, but I think Miami might be the one. I think that's probably the the one division winner that they will beat. Uh. By the end of the year. All right, let's get a couple uh, more football questions and we can talk about uh, a little bit on the unserious side of things. Because I know that's what everyone listened to 21 questions for, for the unserious stuff. Crazy questions. <laughs> yeah, for the crazy stuff. Uh, let's get this one from Thanik. Uh Who gets the Sky Moore snaps, McColl or Richie Charles? Uh, I think that Richie's going to see the immediate uptick. Uh, just because Andy literally told us that he was like, he needs to play more than 10, two snaps. That's my bad. Um, which honestly, sometimes you get into like game flow and you're looking at the play sheet and you're not thinking about those things. Like, right. like coach is not thinking about those things. He's thinking about calling the best play possible. Uh, he's not thinking about who's the third receiver on the field, you know, when, when he calls a specific play. Right. Um, I, I think that, that Richie will see some immediate uptick, but I'm going to write about this. You, you guys can read it over at A to Z Sports later uh, today. Um, but I think the Chiefs really actually have to lean into and see what they got in, in Justin Ross. Um, you got three games left right now in the regular season um, where they're, you know, they matter, but th these aren't the winner go home games, right? right? You have to evaluate that player because if he's like going to be a like a part of your future and a big part of it, like potentially a starting wide receiver, you need to know, right? Because if he's not, and it, it, if it's not going to work, you need to come up with a plan because the receiver room, obviously they need to kind of blow it up a little bit and, and change some things around the off season, get some new bodies in there, veteran hand rookie, and, um, you know, so surround Pat with uh, a little bit more help from that group than what he's getting right now. And uh, if Justin Ross can be a part of that, great. But if uh, if 
he's you know if, if he's just a guy then you, you got to make sure that you're you're doing uh your diligence in the off season to be able to you know give him some competition right yeah. so I, I think finding out as much as possible about justin ross i mean he might obviously he's not like the same type of role or or player even has um as sky Moore, but like you know, I think getting him involved and getting him in the game plan a little bit these next couple of weeks is going to be key. I agree. I think it's a good uh, summation of that question there. Uh, Kyle C. asked Tucker, is Creed still good? Uh, yeah, I, I still think Creed's good. I had made a note on Twitter, and this is all anecdotal, Charles, and I, I want to go back and kind of dig into it a little bit more, but it seems like this year, more than years past, Creed snaps don't have the same like zip on them. Um, I you see, you see Pat drifting back and like reaching for the ball a little bit more than than what I can remember in years past. There were a couple times in that Patriots game the snaps were kind of looping in there. Now Creed's always had the knuckleball snap. He's never really he's never spun it. Um, so he's always had the watermelon uh, knuckleball, whatever you want to call it. The vernacular changes, uh, depending on who you talk to. But I, I don't think that that's necessarily the problem in, in all of it. I think I saw some people say, like, oh, he's a left-handed center with a right-handed quarterback. I don't think that has anything to do with it, too, because, again, if he was spinning it, that would have more to do with, you know, how he was getting it than anything. He's knuckleballing it back there. He's watermelling it back there. There's no rotation on the ball. If you watch a replay, like, there's not, there's not going to be any rotation on the ball. He gets it, finds the laces, everything like that. And I know that there was some conversation about uh, when Kadarius Tony was was off sides of how Creed was holding the ball. He does seem to be holding the ball a little bit more under his chest than out in front. I don't know how much of a change that is. It feels like that's been a change from years past. Again, I want to dive into this a little bit more. I just haven't had the time necessarily since, you know, Sunday when when that game happened to uh, to kind of form my hypothesis on it. But it's something that anecdotally I, I, I have kind of noticed this season and have made note of at almost every game this year. I, I still think he's one of the best centers in the league. And I still think he's he's a top guy at that position. I'm really curious to see what the Chiefs do in terms of contracts moving forward with centers. They've proven in the last few years when they draft these top centers that they'll let them walk and then just draft another top center. Uh, they seem to be able to do that pretty well. Um, but I'm very interested to see. I, I don't think that I think Creed is still good. I still think that you know the both of those guys, Creed and Trey Smith, struggled in the in the interior with Christian Barmore. And look, that guy's good. Uh, he he's good, and it's it's a tough guy to handle. But uh, I I think they're fine. I, I think I think Creed is fine. I think Creed is still good. Um, I'm not too worried about Creed. Any any thoughts on uh, on Creed? Hey, you know, I, I hadn't really noticed a whole lot of the snapping stuff, so I, I'm intrigued to see what you turn up there when you, you delve into it a little bit more. Yeah. But um, I, I just think the entire interior offensive line has a little bit more pressure on them this season than sure. in past because the, the tackles have been struggling, right? Uh, specifically in pass protection. Um, I, I think that they've got a little bit more on them uh, this year being that, you know, they're viewed as like the top interior unit in the NFL and uh, they've been together a couple years now so you know they have that that chemistry they're supposed to be the glue that's holding the line together and you know but in some games the line has been coming apart at the the seams uh on the edges so they, I think you know adding Wanye uh in there at left has been really good so far I think that's helped yeah. that unit out a little bit um I think that Gosh, does does uh, Jawan Taylor need an off season to kind of just uh, get everything back uh, under control? That's kind of that kind of has snowballed a little bit. Um, and as far as the interior goes, I think you know as edges get a little bit more comfortable, that we're going to see them you know pick up and improve a little bit more. Specifically, in pass pro, I think you know the run game, run blocking has been pretty solid. Um, I think you know the Chiefs have probably been a little bit ignorant with um their uh their play calling when it comes to the strengths of their offensive line that you know they they need to run a little bit more power instead of um you know like outside zone or doing like you know shotgun runs when you need like three yards or something but um uh, yeah i i just um i i think that really that the the struggles on the edges have been you know 
more indicative of the problems on the interior than it than anything else. Hmm. Let's move on to this next one from uh, Lee eighty seven Charles. You were if you were hired as the Chiefs' new analytics and data person in Beach's right hand man, give me your postseason re-signing trades, free agent, and draft strategy. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. Um, the two players that I think I'm like re-signing right away that I can like that I can get back here pretty quick uh, would be Tranquil, Drew Tranquil, yeah. get him back. I, I think you need him here. I mean, obviously. We've seen Bolton miss time for two separate injuries this year, and as great as he is, I think Drew having him as a backup and someone who can also play outside uh, or one of the two other linebacker positions in, in base or in sub packages, um, I, I think that's uh, just super valuable uh, for Spags and his defense. I think, you know, obviously you'd, you'd love to get Willie Gay back. He's been making plays uh, lately, but I think that, you know, writing's probably on the wall there that he probably won't. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Noah Gray is someone who's kind of underrated that you probably want to bring back. I mean, obviously both uh, Gray and um, Bell are free agents. I think that Jody Fortson, uh, who's been on injured reserve all year, I think that he's he's either a restricted or exclusive rights free agent, but still a free agent, um, or he might be unrestricted even this year. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But I think you need to bring at least one of the tight ends back uh, to kind of reinforce uh, what he got going on with uh, with Kelsey being you know up there in years and whatnot, um, you know, Noah's proven to be a reliable number two. He hasn't been more than that, but you haven't needed him to be more than that. Really. So, so <laughs> um, you know, we'll we'll kind of see if he ever can be more than that. I have a feeling, um, and, and you know, uh, keeping him in the fold, I don't think it'd be too expensive. I want to keep Legere Sneed. I just don't. I don't know. Um, I think the one one thing with Legere Sneed on the re-signing, you know, I, I think some teams are going to be a little bit afraid of like the knee, but I think the Chiefs are like kind of comfortable where where that's at. I mean, he's been on the injury report every week this season with the knee. Something is wrong there, and um, you know, so I think if the Chiefs offer him a fair deal, I think he will be back. Um, I think Chris Jones, the writing's been on the wall for a while. I don't think he's coming back after this year. It's unfortunate. He's still a dominant player. Um, but I, I, I think, I don't know that what happened this off season necessarily damaged the relationship or anything like that. But I think the fact that they couldn't come to terms on anything long term shows that they're just, they're too far apart. Um, and I would be surprised if, if anything changes in that. So, and, and honestly, those are, those are kind of the guys that I'm looking at. I mean, Mike Dana, you'd like to have him back, but I think he's kind of played himself into a nice contract somewhere else. Someone's got yeah. more money than, than the Chiefs will. Um, you know, Nick Allegretti would be great to, to bring back for another year. If you can have a, a, another, you know, veteran interior offensive lineman in there, but I'm not sure if you want to do that. If you're Kansas City, I think you might be looking more to to maybe draft someone who can be like a future starter and maybe play behind you know a guy like Tooney or or Trey Smith uh, this upcoming year because um, you know those guys are are getting um, I mean Tooney's getting a little long in the t- tooth and his contract are going to have an out year soon and uh, Smith you know next year is going to be a free agent. So um, those those are some things that you know you kind of have to think about when it comes to to free agency resignings. As far as bringing in like some outside free agents, right? I'm looking at interior defensive line as like a huge need outside of wide receiver. Like I think it might even be a bigger need moving forward than wide receiver because at least you have Rasheed Rice in the room who you know like this is a guy who's your wide receiver one right now. He can be a wide receiver one in future years as well, right? I don't think you you don't have anyone right now who you trust to be like DT one or even DT two on the roster, right? The only person under contract right now is Neil Farrell Jr., who has played as some one on Twitter pointed out to me recently twenty two snaps this season. I thought he played none. He has played twenty two snaps this season, surprisingly, um, but I don't recall any of them, which tells you how impactful he has been. Um, so I, I mean, that's a guy that like I we don't really know how much they trust. Is he going to be like, he could be DT1 next year for all we know, or he could be like DT4 or DT5. You, you just don't know. 
uh, you know, looking at some like younger guys out there who are kind of run stopping guys, but also offer some pass upside, uh, Leki Fatu, um, the Arizona Cardinals. Um, I, I think he's a guy that the chiefs will probably have to look at. I think he's only like 26 years old. Um, that would be a nice guy to lock up on a long-term deal and kind of be a foundational piece as a, as kind of run stopper and, uh, and pass rusher. Um, you know, I, I don't think they're going to be in the market for, you know, a ton of guy like, uh, Justin Matabuike from, um, Balt, who's just owned an absolute heater this season. I think he's going to like lead the interior and sacks in the NFL. Um, he, he has a half sack in 11 straight games, at least a half sack in 11 straight games now. Uh, that's the guy who, you know, he's young. I, if you could like one for one replace Chris Jones with a player, that's would be who, who I do it with in free agency. Like I would offer him the contract that Chris Jones wants, right? Like, yeah. I, I think that would be something, but I don't, I don't know that Baltimore lets him out of there. I, I, I'd take that maybe they franchise him or something. I, I just, uh, I, I think they, they figure out a way to keep him because he's been really good this year. And, you know, I'm looking at some other guys like, um, maybe like a Javon Kinlaw who's on San Francisco, hasn't played a whole lot of snaps, like just under 40% of the snaps this season, but has been like mildly productive Has like, I think two and a half sacks in the year, some pressures, whatnot. Like, I think that's a guy that maybe like if you're the chiefs, if you're Brett beach, you feel like you can get a little bit more out of him than, you know, uh, anyone else can moving on the offensive side of ball. I'm thinking wide receiver. You need a veteran in the room. I'm going after Mike Evans hard. Um, even if like I'm, he, even if you know he's a little older, what he's 32, something like that, 31 maybe yeah. next year. So um, I, I think you get Mike Evans in there, a guy who brings veteran leadership and whatnot. Um, if you can't get Mike Evans, maybe go after like a Keenan Allen. You know, he's not going to play all 17 games for you probably because he hasn't played all 17 games lately. But I mean, that's a guy who can be like Pat's, you know, best friend, another type of, um, you know, safety outlet the way Travis Kelsey has been. And, you know, adding a guy like that can probably extend Kelsey's career. Okay. And, and, you know, I don't know that you go after some of these young guys quite as hard in the free agent market, the wide receiver position, unless you have like a surprise, like Kelsey's like, Hey, sorry guys, I'm piecing out to go like retire and travel the world with my, my billionaire girlfriend uh, um, or, or whatever, you know, Fire. like yeah. it, it's possible. Right. Um, I, I don't know that, that he's there yet, but you never know. Um, so if something like that were to happen, obviously you're probably going to have to, um, you know, go out and, and do a little bit more in terms of the, the weapon search. But I think finding that like veteran guy who can be a voice in that room, help some of these younger guys and take some of the pressure off of Kelsey. I, I think that's key. Moving on to the draft. Obviously. Oh, oh, oh well, you know, I, I'll talk about the offensive tackle spot a little bit. Right. Hey, I think Wanya Morris is the future at left tackle. So I don't I don't think I'm going out and signing a left tackle. I don't know that I'm drafting a left tackle high. I think I'm riding it out with Wanya, trying to figure out um, you know, if uh if he if he's the guy for the future. Um I, I think they've seen enough right now that they're comfortable with him at that left tackle spot, which is that's good enough for me, right? And mm-hmm. and I think, you know. Obviously, Joan's here for a couple more years. There's nothing you can do about that. Off season will help him reset, help him get better. And, and I think that you know, um, I've heard good things about Jason Godrick. <laughs> uh, I think he, I think he's going to be a play. It, I think he's going to be in the conversation for swing tackle next year. And this is a guy who's never played professional football until like this year, uh, which is crazy to think about. But I've just heard great things about uh his his uh temperament his training um you know what what the coaching staff has seen from him so far uh, i think he will be back obviously with the team next year and i, I think that he'll he'll play a role and, and i think you know prince tego winogo he's on uh injured reserve i think he had like a peck or so he had some sort of season ending type injury yeah and um I, I think that like that's a guy that they trusted. He probably would have been playing left tackle before Wanye had he been healthy. So I, I think that's a guy 
that you can probably bring back after the injury, maybe cheaply, and re-sign him. And then you got, you know, four tackles there who are competing, maybe bring in undrafted free agent or, you know, sign a veteran to like a cheap, cheap deal, um, you know, to compete and, and bring that, that group up a little bit. But I, I think that group is actually in a better spot than we would have hoped for. Right. Like, yeah. I think they're, I think they're kind of set, but moving on to the draft a little bit. All right. Um, I think, you know, obviously the top three receivers, Odunze, um, neighbors and uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. They're probably, you're not going to, you're not going to no. get those guys unless you move up into the top 15, which would be great. And maybe, you know what? I, I mentioned Kelsey potentially retiring after the season. Maybe if he does retire, you're more prone to like make that type of jump to get a weapon like that for your right. quarterback. Like maybe that's something that you like seriously consider if that happens. But otherwise, I, I just don't see it happening. And I don't know that it needs to because this is one of those years where like it is it is really good to need a wide receiver this year. Like as as frustrated as fans are about the lack of investment, you know, kind of at the position or great investment at the position, I should say, yeah. over the past couple seasons. I mean, Rice has been great this year. Don't get me wrong. Um, but, you know, Sky Moore pick, people are frustrated with that. Maybe the Chiefs were just like looking at this class, you know, down the line and saying like, this is a really good group because that's what I'm looking at them right now. Like there's like, nearly a dozen guys that I would be okay with at the end of round one or like, you know, trading up into, you know, day two, mid day two to get these guys. Yeah. Like, Hey, I mean, I, I, I'll, I can name them off, but we'd be here all day. Right. Like, I, I mean, I think, and I think beach probably feels the same. I think he'll be feeling really good if he manages to land, uh, one of these guys kind of late in the first or, or moving up kind of the same way they did to get Rice last year. And then, you know, moving into round two, I think, you know, pass rushing, defensive tackles, I think you can go grab one. There's a lot of guys, a lot of dudes this year at that spot. Uh, a couple of guys out of Texas, Sweat and Murphy. Um, Braden Fisk out of FSU has been surging lately and looks like a really good player. Um, Brandon Dorless out of Oregon has the most pressures in the FBS among interior uh, offense linemen. Uh, defensive lineman, excuse me. Um, Ruka Oro out of Clemson looks like a really good player. Uh, Notre Dame has one too. I think Howard Howard Cross the third. Like like there are some some guys that like you can get who can help. Like they're not going to be a one to one replacement for Chris Jones, but like it's going to help this defensive line that's going to feel the impact of, of that loss potential, right? And then you know just finally moving into like. Day three, I, I mentioned Brevin Spans forward before, like go grab a tight end, uh, especially if you think that, you know, Kelsey's got a few more years uh, or, or, you know, only a couple more years rather. Um, interior offensive line class is really good. Cornerback, I mean, the Chiefs are just great at finding late round cornerbacks. I like uh, this kid out of Michigan, Mike Sansratil, I think is how you pronounce his last name. Yeah. Uh, and then running back we need lightning to isaiah pacheco's thunder and you know you could sign one in free agency but that's you know a fool's errand i don't think you do that unless it's like a, a cheap deal I, I think they need to draft uh, another young guy to go with pacheco and um there are three guys that that i really like I like arizona running back michael wiley uh boise state running back george halani and Marshall running back Rashim Ali. I think Ali is going to be at the East West Bowl, so mm. uh, maybe we'll we'll have some exclusive stuff with him here pretty soon. Should um, they've had some good running backs in that East West Shrine Bowl uh, right. recently? Uh, good quarterbacks too. Talk about Tommy DeVito, Brock Purdy, Aiden O'Connell right now. All guys out there slinging it uh, from the East West Shrine Bowl. So very uh, very expansive there. Uh, I, I thought a lot of I saw this question come in last night. And I was like, oh, wow, I, I have not thought about what my plan would be. So I put put the brain to it. <laughs> I loved it. I love it. very. Uh, we love thought out questions, thought out answers here. That's what you tune into 21 questions for. But, uh, you know, it's Christmas season. So we're going to get a couple Christmas questions in before we go here, Charles. Um, top three Christmas movies This is from Neil. Shout out, Neil. Top three Christmas movies. Um, mine would probably be 
Number one is Christmas Vacation. Number two is probably Home Alone. And I think Elf sneaks in at number three. I think it's close, but I think Elf will sneak in at number three for me. Yeah, mine is almost like the exact same as yours, but it's Christmas Vacation. Yep. Uh, Number two is Jingle All the Way. I just had a conversation with people on this one. The cast of that movie is fantastic. The story is really good. I mean, you got, you got, uh, you got Arnold, you got Sinbad, you got Phil Hartman. I mean, it's just like, it was a really, really great cast. Uh, and I, I just think it's an overlooked, overlooked film. Uh, and then I think Elf sneaks in at number three for me too. That's just uh, iconic. Uh, and it's always on the TV every year. Oh my gosh. It is. Uh, I love that all the local movie theaters, I'm sure, I'm sure they do it everywhere, but at least in Kansas City, every time I hop on my AMC theaters app, it's like, hey, you can watch, and they always have like the $5 faves of the Christmas movies. You can go to the theater and watch them if you just want to uh, want to watch them in the movie theater. I do enjoy that. Uh, that's always really fun, but there's so many good Christmas movies out there. I A part of me, too, really likes the cheesy Hallmark movies. Like, I know how it's going to end. I find them funny, you know, just to see how ridiculous they can get. And I think they've started to kind of lean into that bit a little bit. So um, I I enjoy those, especially put you in the in the holiday spirit to watch those uh, those cheesy Christmas movies. Uh, Those are those are always the best. And on the topic of Christmas movies, uh, Charles Rugby Fox asks us, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Why or why not? I think it is a Christmas movie, but only because it's like set, like, like it's set during Christmas. You it's gotta be at a Christmas party. I mean, yeah. uh, that's, yeah. I agree. I, I think it's a Christmas movie. Yeah. I think it's a Christmas movie. It's just, it, it's the sub genre, right? Like there are, su- there, there are all these sub genres of Christmas movies. Now you got right. like the, the and, and this was probably the first really like Christmas action movie. But now you got like Christmas action movies coming out like on a yearly basis. You basis so you got uh, Violent Night uh, that just came out. You know Santa going on a on a little killing killing spree. <laughs> but, it's uh, crazy. Yeah, yeah I, I do see. I think Die Hard's a Christmas movie. There's a couple ones out there. Uh, Big B uh, on outside the trenches asked us if we thought Gremlins was a Christmas movie. And then he gets the gremlin for Christmas is a part of like the whole story. It's, Christmas is crucial to the storyline. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that kind of kicked off a little bit of like the Christmas thriller horror genre a little bit. I, have, like, yeah. you know. I Somebody asked me today, actually, if the original Paul Blart movie was a Christmas movie. Because uh, I guess it takes place around Christmas time too. Yeah, might be. I mean, um, I have to know. rewatch. I have to go. I have to hit the tapes. I have to hit the film room to see if that one's actually a Christmas movie. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of a uh, lo- lot of uh, good Christmas movies out there. Last one here, Casey from Casey. Uh, where would you go or are going to go for Christmas lunch slash dinner and the Chiefs game? Top three places. I think he asked. You know, if where, where you would want to spend, like, like yeah, um, Kansas City. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> honestly, so last set, I, I mentioned earlier uh, that, that I had gone to uh, the, the Christmas game several years ago. I think it was Christmas Day, actually, yeah. um, between the Broncos and the Chiefs, that Dontari po- uh, Demetrius Harris throwing Dontari Poe the touchdown, you know, mm-hmm. that, that game. And um, I think afterward, I took uh, – my I took my wife to Gates for the first time, and I I think that <laughs> that memory sticks with me because the the cooks got into a fist fight in the back and were screaming and it was just it was a it was a whole memorable experience and, and honestly it added to the the allure um, of and the myth of Kansas City barbecue. So I mean I think my number one spot I'd be going to Gates. <laughs> I've been game to get to get some get a mixed plate and a free show. <laughs> They're passionate about their barbecue there. You can tell when you walk in and they yell at you. They're they 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 are passionate about it there. I do love some gates. Listen, you can't go wrong in Casey with barbecue anymore. I mean, well, really anytime. But like there's so many good spots that keep some new spots keep popping up everywhere too. As I meet Mitch with uh Seth and Josh, and that's that's a very good spot. That originally started as competition barbecue and some sauces, and now they got a whole brick and mortar place. And you can't go wrong. I think that the number one spot, though, if I would want to or where I would want to go to for Christmas lunch slash dinner and the Chiefs game, 
would be at Arrowhead, right? Like that's I would want I would want that to be at Arrowhead. Um, tailgating to beforehand, you know, some biscuits and gravy. Probably you're going to be out there early. Uh, some mimosas, maybe some breakfast beers. Who knows what's going to go down out at the uh, that the Arrowhead parking lot? But I think that's probably the top place uh, where where I'd want to be for a Christmas Day game for to eat out there. There's so much good stuff out there when it comes to the tailgating out of there. And you just know that it's going to smell amazing. Yeah. Like, like, it, like it smells great every weekend that they're out there tailgating. But like on a holiday, I feel like people just go, they take, kick it up a notch. I feel like the, the, oh, the barbecue and everything that, that everybody's cooking up out there. I mean, you know, um, whenever I tend to go, I try to wander around a little bit and, and meet some of Chief's Kingdom <laughs> as best as I can. Yeah. And uh, my goodness, I, I always am very well fed when I do that. But it, Chief's Kingdom is very kind with, uh, with yeah. their, in their tailgates. Very generous. I, I, I assume I, I just I'm just going to assume there's going to be some spiral hams out there. On oh, yeah. on uh, on Christmas Day, there's going to be some spiral hams. You're going to have see having people uh, have those uh, traditional Christmas dinners out there in the Arrowhead parking lot. But uh, Charles, I appreciate you hopping on with me here and uh, answering some questions, uh, some serious ones, some not so serious ones. But uh, always appreciate your time and your uh, your coverage of this team as they are. You know, we're coming down the home stretch. Only three games left. Yeah, three games left in the regular season, and then you know potentially a deep. Postseason run. <laughs> Never count them out. Never count. All right, that's going to do it for this week's edition of 21 Questions. Appreciate you guys listening all the way to the end of the podcast. As we mentioned before, if you want to get in on answer asking these questions for us to answer, you can go to kcsn.subject.com. You can subscribe for $5 a month, 30 a year, and that gives you access to our KCSN Discord where all of these questions were asked. Go take advantage of that. It's a great deal. You'll get stuff from Charles. And you'll get stuff from the the film guys, the Maddie, Kent, and Craig, and also Joseph Effer writing some great stuff on the analytical data side of things as well. So go check that out. Really appreciate you listening to all the way to the end of the podcast. For Charles Goldman, I'm Tucker Franklin. We'll catch you later.